Welcome everyone to Fundamentals of Kabbalah and Hasidut, continuing our series on the life and teachings of the Baal Shem Tov. Tonight I want to do something a bit different, and that is, this is our last class before Shavuot. Everyone should know, next Tuesday night, instead of our class, we have the holiday of Shavuot. So there will be no class next week. And what I wanted to do is something very, very interesting. The Baal Shem Tov passed away on Shavuot. So obviously there's a deep connection here between the Baal Shem Tov and, and the Torah in general and Shavuos. But also someone else very important, passed away uh, on Shavuos, and that's David Melech. So here we have a deep connection that we're going to explore tonight, that these things are not considered coincidences. If the Baal Shem Tov passes away in Shavuos, and the same day that David Melech passed away, there we should look for a connection. And even without this, as we will see, there are many, many connections between the life of the Baal Shem Tov and the life of David Amelech. But there's one more personality who's obviously very important to Shavuot is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe is the one who went up on Har Sinai and received the two tablets of the law. So tonight, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to see very, very beautiful and deep connections between these three personalities. And in the process, we will be revealing much about the life of the Baal Shem Tov. Our first few classes were about the life of the Baal Shem Tov. We obviously didn't get into everything. And then we began with the general teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, which became the fundamental pillars of the Hasidic movement. So tonight we're a bit of a, we'll call it a review, and we're going to fill in uh, some important connections in the life of the Baal Shem Tov. But here we're going to see on a very deep soul level the connection between these three personalities. Moshe, David Amelech, and the Baal Shem Tov. I, I'm not presenting this in any uh, order of importance. It's just this is the way I kind of jotted down my, my notes. So it's not in, in a uh, chronological order or of priorities of, of importance. So we're going to start with music. We're going to start with music. David Amelech, of course, was called the uh, Naim Zimirot Yisrael, the sweet singer of Israel. That's how he's referred to. Uh, Naim Zimirot Yisrael, the sweet singer of Israel. And of course, David Amelech is the writer, composer, and compiler of the Book of Psalms, which we have to understand were written as, as music. We're used to, in many cases, of reciting the Psalms, but David Melech was a master musician, and he composed these Tehillim to, to music. His son Shlomo also composed uh, lots of, of songs, lots of songs. So here we immediately we see a, a, a deep connection between David and Melech and music. We've actually learned this before in, in the Parsha class, Usually we don't identify Moshe with music, 
but we should because uh, five of the archetypal songs sung throughout history. Traditionally, we say there are 10 archetypal songs sung through creation, through history. Nine of them have been sung already. The 10th is waiting for Mashiach, Shir Lashem Shir Chadash. A new song will be introduced by Mashiach, which will really represent the whole Messianic age. And we're going to see now, very, very quickly, because we've done this in the Parsha class, Moshe Rabbeinu, who we usually think of a leader, our teacher, the one who received the Torah, but he is intrinsically connected to music. In the Torah itself, so Moshe leads the Song of the Sea in the book of Shemot. He teaches the people the song of Ha'azinu in the book of Devarim. Then there is the song of the well, where he, he doesn't lead the, the singing, but he is really the main subject of the song. The song of the well in the book of, of uh, uh, Midbar, Numbers. So that's three already in the Torah. He's also connected to one of the songs is that when Yoshua stopped the sun. One second. When Yoshua stopped the sun, he sang the song of the sun. However, we understand that. That is the tradition. He was able to stop the sun because he sang its song. It's very similar to what we learn in Perak Shira, that every creation, including the sun, has a song. And Yeshua was able to sing the song of the sun and have it stay in its place until he won the war that he was involved with. Question is, where did Yeshua learn the song of the sun? So we're told, the, the, the Talmud tells us, when Moshe uh, went up on the hill and raised his hands in the fight against Amalek, he also stopped the sun. And he did it through singing the song of the sun, and he taught it to Yoshua. So now we have four of the archetypal songs sung throughout all of history <coughs> using that Moshe is involved with. And then we see there is a fifth song, and that's the song of Mashiach. Because our tradition tells us that the soul of Mashiach will be the soul of Moshe. But here we see a deep connection because we're told that the nephesh of David will be contained in the soul of Mashiach, and the ruach, the neshama of Moshe, will be in Mashiach as well. As it says about Moshe, Hu goel rishon Hu goel ha'acharon. He is the first redeemer and he is the last redeemer. So we did this very quickly, but here we see a deep connection between David and Moshe. David and Moshe, parts of their soul will be contained in the soul of Mashiach. And it's intrinsically connected with song. Now let's bring in the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov was, was instrumental. That's a, this is a play on words, a pun here. Was instrumental in reintroducing music and song to prayer. That in the, in the first generation, maybe two or even three generations of Hasidut, song in prayer became vital. And to this day, to this day, singing the prayers in most Hasidic communities is, is a very, very important part of how we pray. So here we see the Baal Shem Tov really revolutionized our concept of prayer and a big part of it 
was the joy that he introduced through the singing, through the music of prayer. And as we've learned before, the numerical value, the gematria of prayer, tefillah equals 515, which is the same as shira, the song for, for uh, the numerical value for song, 515, shira. So here, a deep connection between shira and tefillah. And here we see all three of these personalities were intrinsically uh, tied to music and song. The next connection or parallel between these three is really in their life stories, all three of them experienced exile and wandering. It was a big part of who they were and who they became. The Baal Shem Tov, as we learned, uh, he was orphaned from his father at age five. Within a year or two, his mother passed away. And he was uh, this very independent and very brave. And he would go wandering in the forest from a very early age. And he actually was, in a sense, adopted by one of the hidden Sadikim one time when he was wandering through the forest. And after that, he, he made going out into nature and communing with God and praying to God and going to mikvahs in, in nature and meditating and learning by himself, wandering. David Amelech, from his infancy, was set apart from the rest of his family. Uh, there was a controversy over his birth, and he became a shepherd as, at a very young age. And he was out in the fields for the first uh, 20, 25 years of his life until Shmuel comes and anoints him, he was in exile really from his family. And he, he really lived out in the fields. Moshe Rabbeinu, after he killed the Mitzri who was about to kill a Jew, he also had to go into exile. When, when it became known, Pharaoh wanted to kill him. He had to flee from Egypt. There are many, many midrashim where he went and how long it took, but he was gone from anywhere from 40 to 60 years until God appeared to him in the burning bush. So we see that this, these experiences of, of being alone and wandering and being in exile, Moshe became a shepherd as well for, for many years. So this is also something that really brings these personalities together, that they, they experience solitude. And because of that, they uh, were able to form and forge a very, very unique and intimate relationship with God. They were in, in constant communication with God, all three of them. So the next idea is very, very connected to this, that all of them were very connected to the, the two words that are used for meditation, heat bonanut and heat bodedut. Heat bodedut comes from the word boded, to be alone. So here we saw all three of these personalities, Baal Shem Tov, David, and Moshe, spent large amounts of their life alone and in nature. And that gave them this uh, incredibly intimate relationship with, with Hashem. And also, they all used that time 
for deep meditation. All three of them, along with all the other patriarchs and matriarchs who were all shepherds and were all out in nature in the fields for long periods of time. And as Rabbi Kaplan said, all prophecy ultimately comes from states of, of meditation. And Moshe was the greatest of all of the prophets. David Amelech, according to the Arizal, was the greatest in what's called Ruach HaKodesh, which is a slightly less level than prophecy, even though David was considered a prophet. But he was, in English, we'll, we'll translate it as, as divine inspiration. He was divinely inspired. The Baal Shem Tov also, he, he was able to see things, perceive things, understand things way beyond logic. He was able to transcend the physical material world and he, would, he, he, knew, he knew things through what's called Ruach HaKodesh. <clears throat> The next idea that connects all three of them is Eretz Yisrael. You'll excuse me for one second. All three, <clears throat> the Baal Shem Tov, David, and Moshe are, are super connected to Eretz Yisrael. The Baal Shem Tov, as we learned, even though it was extremely rare in his day for someone from Europe <clears throat> to attempt to come to Israel, the Baal Shem Tov did attempt to come to Israel, and he was actually on the ship from Istanbul to Akko when his ship was pirated, hijacked, and he never made it. But the point is that his attempt to come spiritually broke through a lot of barriers. <clears throat> and then, I believe we learned this just two weeks ago, one of his main students, Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk, he came in 1770 with a, a couple hundred to the families, which was unheard of, it was, it was almost unheard of of an individual to come. But here you had 200 families coming to Israel together. And they settled in, at first in Pekin, and then in Sfat, and then ultimately in Tveria. So the Baal Shem Tov paved the way for the return of Am Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael. Many of the students of the Vilna Gaon who was a chief, uh, uh, almost a thorn in, in the Baal Shem Tov side, an opponent, also many of his students began to come to Eretz Yisrael also in a trickle. That's all that was possible in those days. So here we see the Baal Shem Tov was very connected to Eretz Yisrael. David Amelech is the one who, who more than anyone else conquered all of Eretz Yisrael. Yoshua uh, never finished the job. The borders that David and Melech conquered were the, were the largest borders in all of Jewish history. And so he really was the, the ultimate conqueror of Eretz Yisrael and of Yerushalayim. I should mention that tonight, tonight and tomorrow is Yom Yerushalayim is the day during the Six-Day War in 1967 that the uh, city of Jerusalem was united after 2,000 years. But it was David Amelech who first established Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And he was the, the, the instigator of the idea of building a temple for God. Until then, all we had was the Mishkan. For hundreds of years, all we had the Mishkan. But David and Melech wanted to build a temple, and then it fell to his son, 
Shlomo, who did build the temple in Yerushalayim. And Moshe, what's his connection to Eretz Yisrael? He desperately wanted to come to Eretz Yisrael. He led the people through the desert for 40 years. And then in Parshat Ve'et Hanan, we learn that because he had hit the rock, God decreed very mysteriously, but God decreed that he could not come into Eretz Yisrael. But nonetheless, in Parshat Ve'et Hanan, Moshe Rabbeinu prayed 515 prayers to come into Eretz Yisrael. It was his greatest desire in life. Now, that number 515 should be familiar because we just learned it. 515 equals tefillah, equals prayer. 515 equals shira, song. But it also equals the etchanan, the name of the Torah portion that explains how Moshe pleaded. That's, that's the way we'll translate it. It's a kind of prayer of pleading. Moshe Rabbeinu pleaded 515 prayers to come into Eretz Yisrael because Ve'at Hanan is Gematria 515. So the sages learn that he prayed 515 different prayers to come into Eretz Yisrael. So here we see the Baal Shem Tov, David Melech, and Moshe, all super connected to Eretz Yisrael. Now we'll look at the, the name Adam. Adam, of course, is the name of the first human being. The Arizal, and many of you have heard this, <coughs> explain that each letter of the word Adam stands for the name of, of, of a person. So the Aleph of Adam stands for Adam. The Dalad stands for David. And the Mem stands for Mashiach. So the Ariz said, because all humanity comes from Adam and Chava. And so Adam, David, and Mashiach are all contained within Adam. Now, we already learned that Moshe and Mashiach are, in a, in a sense, the, the, the same neshama, or at least part of the neshama of the Mashiach is Moshe. The name Moshe begins Mem Shin. The name Mashiach begins Mem Shin. Moshe is Mashiach. Hu goela rishon, hu goela acharon. So here we have Adam, we could read it as Adam, David, Moshe. And a different way to read it also is Avraham, David, Moshe. So this is just connecting the David and Moshe. <clears throat> so how is the Baal Shem Tov connected? According to Hasidic tradition, one of the components of the soul of the Baal Shem Tov is the nefesh of David Melech. And I believe it was last week we learned that the ruach of David Melech was in the Orachaim. And that is a very, very famous rabbi from Morocco who came to Israel during the lifetime of the Baal Shem Tov. And that is one of the main reasons the Baal Shem Tov wanted to come to Israel because he felt if he could get together with the Orachaim, together they could bring Mashiach. Because David, uh, the Baal Shem Tov had this, the nefesh of David, and the Orachaim had the ruach of David. So again, here we see uh, these deep connections between the Baal Shem Tov, David, and Moshe. Another aspect which is, is connected to what we talked about before about being in a state of exile, in a state of wandering, all three of these personalities went through stages where they were totally hidden. People didn't know or appreciate or acknowledge who they were. They were totally, totally hidden. The Baal Shem Tov was hidden until he was 36 years old. 
even though along the way <clears throat> he almost inadvertently was revealed, his greatness was revealed to other people, but he always made them promise not to tell anyone. And in, in a certain town where he would start healing people and uh, drawing crowds, he would leave, he would disappear and move someplace else until he was 36. And then he revealed himself. He it really, he was commanded by his spiritual mentor, Achia Hashiloni, to reveal himself. David Amelech, as we said, was exiled from his family. They barely acknowledged him as part of the family. So when Shmuel and Navi came at, at God's command, God said, go to the, to the family, the house of Yishai, and, and anoint one of his sons because God was in the process of taking away the kingship from King Saul, the first king of Israel. So Shemola Navi comes and he sees the first son. He's like handsome and strong, charismatic. And Shemola is obviously this is the one. And God said, no, -uh. You're, you're not looking deep enough. And basically, he, every one of the sons was like a star. And each one, when, when Shmuel and Nabi was thinking, maybe this is the one he meant. And he goes to seven of his sons. And then he says to Yishai, is this all of your sons? And almost embarrassingly, Yishai said, well, there is one more son, but he's out in the fields. And Shmuel said, bring him to me. And when he did, God said, this is the one. And Shmuel anointed him in secret. And so for a number of years, he was actually anointed as the, the, the next king of Israel. But it was hidden. David did not reveal it to anyone. And he actually had a number of opportunities to kill Shaul, who was trying to kill him. So it, it, it would have been justified self-defense, and he refused to lay a hand on Shaul. He loved Shaul. Shaul was his father-in-law. He refused to lay a hand on, on, on Shaul and basically said to God, if you, if you, if you deem me um, worthy to be king, you're going to have to do it. I, I, I'm not, I'm not going to like force the issue. So he was, he, he was hidden from his family. And even after he was anointed, he was hidden. Moshe Rabbeinu, he was the prince of Egypt. But once he killed the Egyptian and had to flee, so he disappeared from the scene. As, as if disappeared from history. And, and then he reappears 40 or 60 years later when God reveals himself at the burning bush. So we see incredible parallels between these three personalities. And for those who came in late, the reason we're, we're doing this is because the Baal Shem Tov passes away on Shavuot and David Melech passes away on Shavuot. And the, the, the main figure is, uh, of Shavuot is Moshe. Moshe received the Torah. Okay. Okay, now we have a beautiful connection with the word chai, life. We're going to see that all three of these have a deep connection to, to life. So first of all, the Baal Shem Tov is born Chai Elo. He's born on the 18th day of Elo, the, the life force of the month of Elo. So he's very connected to Chai. He reveals himself at 36, which is twice high. 
David of Melech had 18 wives. And uh, if you count the different battles that he fought, as recorded, he fought 18 battles. And so I heard from Rav Ginsburg, there's this teaching that uh, on the merit of his wives, he was able to be victorious in his 18 battles. His 18 wives were, uh, were uh, instrumental, critical in his ability to be successful in, in war. Mashiach, we mentioned that David has a connection to Mashiach. The Baal Shem Tov has a connection to David who's connected to Mashiach, Mashiach ben David. And Moshe, he is the first redeemer, he's the last redeemer. And he is, he is the, really the essence of the soul of Mashiach. So if you take the word Mashiach and you permute the letter, it spells out Shem Chai, the living name, the, the name that is alive, because the Mashiach will, will bring a life of peace and harmony and uh, completeness to the whole world. It'll be a different type of life altogether. Then there's a, a deep connection with the word tov. Here that we saw a connection with chai. And we, actually, if we get to it, there's a, a, a much deeper connection with uh, the Baal Shem Tov and chai. Well, you know, I'll just bring it right now. The um, one, one of the uh, statements in, in the Torah back in the book of Vayikra, when it's talking about the mitzvah, it says, v'chai bahem, and you shall live with them. So the sages interpret, what does it mean you shall live in them? They interpret it, you should live with the mitzvah and not die because of them. And this establishes the, the very important rule, concept, that we're not expected to die to keep the mitzvot. If someone is quite literally starving to death and the only thing they could eat is something that's not kosher, you eat it because life comes before the mitzvot. On Shabbos, as we know, if, if there's a danger to life or even a, a doubt of a danger to life, it supersedes the laws of Shabbat. So, v'chai behem. Rashi says, chai behem in the world to come. Not only in this world, but in the world to come. The Baal Shem Tov, though, added, not in disagreement, but he added this idea of doing mitzvot with joy, and, and our full life force. And it's, it's a, a kind of a synergy that every mitzvah is brimming with life force. But if we do the mitzvot by rote, by routine, we, we don't access their life force. But when we do do them with chai behem, you, you, become alive when doing the mitzvot, when you have that kavana. And this is from the Baal Shem Tov. And again, this, is, this becomes one of the pillars of the, of the Hasidic movement, especially the first few generations. The idea of doing mitzvot with joy and enthusiasm and excitement and inspiration, the first few uh, generations, that was one of the reasons that the, let's say, the, the rabbinic elite were a little bit uh, freaked out by the Hasidim, because like, 
they'd never seen people doing mitzvot like with such a arousal. And it was like, whoa, what's going on here? But obviously they, they came to understand that what the Baal Shem Tov was teaching was, was v'chai behem. So here we see a connection of the Baal Shem Tov with, with uh, life force. Now the idea of Tov. So his technical name is Yisrael ben Eliezer. But the Baal Shem Tov became, that's, that's how we refer to him. Either the Besht, which is a uh, abbreviated form of the Baal Shem Tov. But the name Tov here is important. In the first verse of the Torah, this is a teaching from, the, from Rav Ginsburg, there's a very, very hidden name of God. It's, it's one of the most hidden because it, it, it never appears really in, in, the, in the Chumash, the Tanakh, in, in the Midrash, in the Talmud. Nonetheless, in Kabbalistic tradition, one of the names of God is an Aleph and a He and a Vav and a He. And where does this appear in the first verse? It's the acronym of Et Hashemayim Ve'et Ha'oretz. And this name of God, its numerical value is 17, which is Tov. And, and I, I learned this from Rob Ginsburg that there is a, a tradition that one of the reasons that we call him the Baal Shem Tov is because of this name. Because what does it mean? Eta Shemayim Bet Arts means in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the Baal Shem Tov came, one of his, his main uh, purposes was to unify the heavens and the earth. We learned this already based on the verse, in all of your ways, know him. And the Baal Shem Tov taught, and it was, it was, it was quite revolutionary in its time, was along with serving God through learning Torah and prayer, we can serve God and be connected to God and uh, and bring godliness through even our mundane actions. Everything is an opportunity to get close to God and to connect it to spirituality. So this name, Aleph and He and Vav and He, is called the good name of God. And it's connected to the Baal Shem Tov. David Melech, I don't have it in front of me, and you'll pardon me because I didn't um, have the chance to get the exact language. But in one place, David Melech is described as being um, very, very handsome and beautiful eyes. But one of those words is tov, that he was uh, tov mare. He was a good looking, handsome. And so the, so the David and Melech was described as being good. Moshe Rabbeinu, when he was born, so it says in the Torah that they saw, um, well, well, let's go back. The first time that the word tov appears is on the first day of creation, when God creates light. And it says, God saw the light, that it was good. He saw the light was good. And when Moshe is born, so the Torah describes that they saw, when they, when they looked at this newborn baby, they, they said, they saw that he was good. So Rashi explains, what, what, is, what does that mean? More than he was, he was beautiful, all babies are beautiful. He was beautiful, he was handsome. 
But it, the, the tradition is that when Moshe was born, the room filled with light. And this was the light, the, the initial light of creation that was hidden away. And that's actually what Rashi explains. When it says God saw the light that it was good, Rashi says it was good to hide away for the tzaddikim in the time to come. So I'm bringing all of this to show that Moshe Rabbeinu in his, his, his essence is good, is full of light. That's why when he came down from the mountain with the, with the uh, second tablets, his, the light emanating from his face was so awesome that people were afraid to look at him. And, and Moshe put on a veil because the people were like, uh, just the, the awe was, was too much. It was just too much for them. So again, here we see the Baal Shem Tov is intrinsically, essentially connected to Tov, goodness. David and Melech is described as being good. And here we see Moshe also. The Moshe's essence, the light of Moshe was good. Now let's just look at chesed. So the, the, the name of the whole movement that the Baal Shem begins is chasidut, from the word chesed. Because along with all of the teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, the, maybe the pillar was to love every Jew, and to do good to every Jew. The inner dimension of chesed is loving kindness. And this is what his father taught him at, at, at his deathbed. It was his last will and testament to his son. And he told him to not to be afraid of anything or anyone but God, and to love every Jew completely. So here we see the Baal Shem Tov, his connection to Chesed. David a Melech, so in Tehillim he says, Ki Chasidani. He's speaking to God and he says, God, I'm a Chasid. <laughs> He's like, he, he, this is a deep connection to the Baal Shem Tov. He says, I am, I am a Chasid. And so the, the Gemara asks, well, what is, what is the chesed of David? And they explain that all the other kings would wake up late in the morning. Everyone would uh, wait, wait on them hand and foot. They're kings. And they said David and Melech would wake up easy, early. And he would be involved, he would have uh, bloody hands because women would come to him to get a, a, a legal uh, decision whether they were still in Nida or they could uh, begin the, 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 the purification to go to the mikvah to be intimate with their husbands again. David and Melech was a great Torah scholar. So the, so the Talmud says his chesed is instead of like acting like everyone wait on me, he was waiting on everyone else. He was, he, he, and he was always doing his best to, to allow husbands and wives to be together. Moshe Rabbeinu, his whole life was doing, doing chesed. He saves a Jew from being killed by the Egyptian and he has to flee. When he comes to the well, he doesn't know these young ladies, Sipporah and her sisters, but he puts his life on the line to do good for them. 
he became a shepherd. And we're told the famous Midrash is that when one of his sheep ran away, so Moshe Rabbeinu himself went to look for the sheep. And when he found the sheep, he put the sheep on his shoulders and he carried it back because he felt so bad because it appeared that the sheep ran away because he didn't have enough water. He was looking for water. And the Midrash says God saw Moshe's compassion, his chesed. And he said, that's the shepherd I want for my people. And Moshe Rabbeinu was saving the people from God's anger all the time. So he's, he's constantly doing chesed and through Mesira Nefesh. Okay, we're, we're getting towards the end of the class. Well, we, I'll just mention this also. Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah itself testifies he was the greatest of all of the prophets. We're told that even Mashiach, no one will reach the level of Moshe. Actually, we're taught that he had a counter prophet, Bilam. And we see Bilam's prophecies also were, are quoted to this day. But we're told that uh, he was, Moshe was on the side of holiness. As we mentioned, David, uh, David Amelech, according to the Arizal, is a prophet, but he was the highest in divine inspiration. And that's why he was able to give us to this day, 3,000 years later, the book of Psalms. These were divinely inspired. And the Baal Shem Tov also had Ruach HaKodesh. He had absolute Ruach HaKodesh. And many of the uh, Hasidic Rebbe's also had Ruach HaKodesh. And just in our generation, uh, I'm sure everyone's heard hundreds and hundreds of stories of the Lubavitcher Rebbe knowing things that we have no idea how he knew what he knew. <laughs> this is what we call Ruach HaKodesh. It's not, it's not prophecy, but it's, it's divine inspiration that allows someone to see what other people cannot necessarily see. So all three of these figures are on this transcendental kind of uh, spiritual level. And the last thing I'll mention, because it, it fits in very well with our current situation in Israel and Jews around the world, is all three of them had tremendous opposition. And nonetheless, they were able to um, be strong and to uh, fight through till really till victory. The Baal Shem Tov, in his lifetime, he and, and, and his whole, at that point was, we'll call it a nascent movement, was, was put in, in Kherom, were uh, like uh, separated from the Jewish people. He had tremendous opposition, but he knew exactly what he was doing and what he was teaching and where it was leading. And the first few generations, many of the rabbis had to fight the same battle, but they were all inspired by the Baal Shem Tov. And it wasn't until the third or fourth generation that the split between the Midnagdim and the Hasidim finally calmed down, but it took a few generations. And anyone who was a Hasid, especially a Hasidic Rebbe, had to put up with incredible opposition. 
David and Melech, we've already mentioned the, the, the opposition he had in his own family. And then he was chased by his own father-in-law who wanted to kill him. And then David and Melech fights 18 different major battles against a whole array of enemies in order to secure the, the, the borders of Eretz Yisrael. His whole, especially when you read the Tehillim, they are infused with David's perspective of being chased, hated, exiled, um, uh, looked down upon, and being uh, fought against. When you read the, the Psalms, it, it runs through the, all the Psalms. David of Melech, of course, had Ruach HaKodesh, and he understood that this would be the reality of the Jewish people. And oh, are we seeing it right now? It's like in living color right now. And Moshe Rabbeinu in the desert, look at the opposition he had, the rebellions, the, the, the the times that they wanted to go back to Egypt, they wanted to stone him. The opposition was incredible, but he per, uh, persevered and he brought us to the gates of the Holy Land. So may our present situation be uh, inspired by these three uh, archetypal giant spiritual figures, the Baal Shem Tov, David Melech, and Moshe Rabbeinu. And we, may we also per persevere and be victorious and bring the whole world to, to godliness and, 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 and Torah and peace.